Chapter 9, Section 1 Adaptation Adaptation is a vital process for the survival of all species of life. This is why we are going to spend a little time discussing this very important process, adaptation, so that we can discover how all life here on Earth began to adapt to new environments in order to continue to survive, or couldn't adapt and therefore went extinct. And this is how adaptation developed many thousands of different classifications of new species of life to evolve throughout our Earth's history, as we briefly described in Chapter 4, that caused new genetic variations to be introduced into a species genetic makeup. Remember in chapter 4 when we mentioned how if a certain species up to a certain point had only lived on a food source of nuts for example but that specific area that nuts grew suddenly had drought conditions and ran out of water one day so that the nuts couldn't grow in this area any longer. Then this particular species would have to do three of the following things. Starve to death and go extinct. Relocate to another area, in other words, new environments, to find their food source of nuts somewhere else. Or find an alternative food source in order to survive. However, this process of survival would put a huge emotional strain on this particular species to adapt its genes so that the new species would begin to seek out new alternative food sources such as altering its digestive choices to eat seeds or berries instead of nuts for example. This is how genetic adaptation or genetic variation has continued in most species of life throughout many millions of years because evolution is the process by which all populations of individual species may need to change over many generations or as rapidly as one generation depending on the species and its need for survival. And genetic variation underlies these changes, also called mutations. And just like some recent independent evolutionary research studies that we discussed concerning the wild white mice found in the brown Nebraska sandhills and that genetic variation alters gene activity or protein function and introduces different traits into a particular species such as changing the white fur of these white mice into brown fur to camouflage the white mice from becoming prey from raptor birds spotting them for their dinner on these brown Nebraska sand hills. Therefore, if these new traits were advantageous and helped the individual species of mice to survive and reproduce, this genetic variation was more likely to be passed into the next generation of offspring born. And this is a process known as natural selection. And as many generations of individuals with this new trait continue to reproduce, the advantageous trait will become increasingly common in a population of wild mice, for example, making the population different than its ancestral one. And sometimes the population becomes so different that it's considered a new species. This is how all species of life here on Earth began to evolve to survive, but introduced many thousands of new classifications of species to begin life here on Earth. This is the reason that adaptation is an extremely important aspect of all life, because somewhere amongst these thousands of different classifications of new species, we can find the very first humans that began life approximately 7 million years ago. And as you are about to discover shortly, we are a very young species compared to the many thousands of new classifications of different species of life 
throughout our Earth's history. This is how adaptation has taken many millions of species to begin to create new classifications of new species of life to evolve here on Earth. This is the reason that throughout this very small chapter we are going to describe a very simplified version of the story of our home, our fragile planet Earth's history. As mentioned in Chapter 8, so far astronomers and science experts have not been successful in finding any other life forms on any other planets in our solar system or in our universe except for rocks, minerals and many different gases. This is because only our own very special planet Earth had the perfect combination of moisture, carbon dioxide and natural mineral elements and was in perfect distance to the sun's rays of energy to begin the activation of this complex process that science experts refer to as photosynthesis that began the very first very simple plant life forms to appear approximately 3,000 million years ago all created, remember, through the great universal law of nature. These were the very first signs of life here on Earth approximately 3,000 million years ago but millions of years later once the perfect distance of the sun's light rays of energy became more aligned with our Earth, photosynthesis became an abundant process and this began to adapt these very first very simple plant life forms to adapt to new environments in order for plant species to survive and throughout many millions of years genetic variations evolved many new and different classifications of new species of plants, vegetation and many different tree species to begin appearing here on earth. And once many new and different species of plants, plankton in our oceans and many different tree species began to appear here on earth, this gave rise to an abundance of oxygen because all of these different tree and plant species began to absorb toxic carbon dioxide and instead trees and plants replaced these toxic gases with oxygen, the fresh air that we all breathe today. And many millions of years later, once these, there was an abundance of oxygen in our Earth's atmosphere, many thousands of new species of life began to appear that began to genetically adapt to new environments by evolving lungs to breathe oxygen as their main source of survival. However, we mustn't forget that the discussions that we had in Chapter 4 and how these genetic variations happened over many millions and millions of years. This is why all species of life had to adapt to new environments in order to survive over a period of many millions of years because of many different changing environmental pressures that meant that thousands of new species began to genetically adapt in order to continue to survive or they simply couldn't adapt and went extinct. This is how all species of life here on Earth began to adapt to survive that introduced many thousands of new classifications of species to begin life here on Earth. This is the reason that adaptation is an extremely important aspect of all life and this is why throughout the rest of this chapter we are now going to briefly go through the history and evolution of our Earth and how each classification of species of life here on Earth began to adapt to new environments in order to continue to genetically evolve and survive. And through this evolutionary process, this is how small gene variations get passed on genetically to each new generation of offspring born and how all gene variations
began new classifications of many different and new species of life to evolve. This will help you to appreciate the vastness of this genetic evolutionary process for all life here on Earth, including our own human life. Our vulnerable and fragile planet Earth began its existence approximately 4.5 billion years ago. However, up to approximately 3,000 million years ago, all that could be found on our Earth were gases such as carbon dioxide, minerals, moisture and rocks. And then suddenly, around 3,000 million years ago, something extremely magical began to take place here on Earth. It was a very special ingredient because the distance from the Sun began aligning with our Earth that allowed the Sun's light energy to begin activating a very important but complex process called photosynthesis to begin. Because photosynthesis could only take place by the Sun's light energy combining with carbon dioxide, some minerals and moisture that initiated this very important complex process called photosynthesis to begin. All created, remember, by the great universal law of nature. Photosynthesis was such a very special natural ingredient because its process by which the green plants and other organisms use sunlight to synthesize nutrients from carbon dioxide and water. It involves chlorophyll, that is the green colour of plants, that generates oxygen as its byproduct. In other words, photosynthesis transforms light energy into chemical energy through cellular respiration. And once the distance from the sun to the earth became more aligned with our earth, this began the very first very simple plant life to grow and develop here on earth approximately 3,000 million years ago. And over many millions of years, once the distance from the sun to the earth became more perfectly aligned with our earth, this very simple plant life became much more abundant over our earth. And this is when many new plant species and plant classifications began to appear here on Earth that genetically adapted to new environments in order to survive. And millions of years later, the universal law of nature then went one step further by adapting some of these plants to some new environments to genetically adapt into new species and classifications of plants and trees so that the roots of plants and trees were more easily able to absorb many of these toxic carbon dioxide gases and instead convert these toxic gases into another more beneficial and very important pure gas called oxygen that very slowly over many millions of years began to emerge as the abundant gas that entered into our Earth's atmosphere, creating a safe ozone layer to protect our Earth from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And once there was enough abundance of sunlight energy, many new classifications and species of plants and trees began to emerge that produced a great deal more oxygen. And once there was an abundance of oxygen in our Earth's atmosphere, the very first living organisms began to appear on Earth that began to adapt to these new environments through relying on oxygen to breathe. And this is how, after a period of many millions of years later, many new classifications of life began to appear that genetically adapted from these early organisms to rely on oxygen for its survival. However, no life here on Earth would ever have begun without the sun's light energy, moisture, carbon dioxide and a few mineral elements that allowed this complex process 
called photosynthesis to begin to develop these very first, very simple plant life forms approximately 3,000 million years ago. This is why photosynthesis still remains one of the most vital life-giving natural components that has continued here on planet Earth and is the very same process that we are all still use to survive today that grows all of our edible foods, crops, fruits, vegetables, seeds, berries, nuts and all of our human and animal foods etc. And photosynthesis is also the exact same process that still continues to grow all of our different species of trees and plants in our rainforests and forests and all vegetation that continues to provide a large percentage of all oxygen breathing species enough oxygen including ourselves and feeds all of our herbivore wildlife wild plants insects reptiles wild animals mammals marine life in all of our oceans and all different classifications of animals and creatures here on earth also without trees and plants in our forests and rainforests trees couldn't absorb the huge amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from entering into our earth's atmospheric ozone and causing more ultraviolet radiation from the sun to heat up our earth and that is the main reason and the cause of all global warming today. Photosynthesis is a complex process where the sunlight's energy converts into electrical and chemical energies through inputs of carbon dioxide CO2, water H2O and minerals and where the products of sunlight are used to convert carbon dioxide to carbohydrates, food and oxygen. This is why photosynthesis is one of the most important natural processes that has given rise to all life here on earth because only photosynthesis is able to grow all new plants, trees and all new plant life and only plants, trees and all new plant life provided enough oxygen that began to genetically adapt all of these new classifications of species of life that relied on oxygen to breathe here on earth. This became the very first of a very long list of all new classifications of new oxygen breathing species that began to genetically adapt and so photosynthesis has become the most important natural biological process that has ever occurred here on earth. However, we all have to thank the sunlight's energy for providing us all with this natural biological process. So here is a very basic history of the evolution of our earth that began approximately 3,000 million years ago. After these very first very simple plant life forms began to evolve approximately 3,000 million years ago, small genetic adaptations began to develop over a long period of millions of years into new plant traits and this occurred through new plants having to adapt to new environments in order to survive and this is when the very first first classification of eukaryotes began to appear here on earth. Eukaryotes may have been present much earlier but the oxygenation of the earth's atmosphere was a prerequisite for the evolution of the most complex eukaryote cells from which all multicellular organisms were built. Eukaryotes are organisms whose cells have a nucleus enclosed within membranes. But new genetic variations began to appear around 1,200 million years ago.
that adapted to new environments in order to survive through genetically adapting into the very first sexual reproduction called meiosis because this is when single-celled eukaryotes and the first sexual reproduction appeared in the fossil records. Then, around 800 million years ago, small genetic variations began to adapt to new environments in order to survive through the genetic adaptation of the first multicellular organisms. And by 750 million years ago, the first protozoa that were the first diverse group of unicellular eukaryote organisms. And then, around 600 million years ago, life on Earth began on land. Because this is when there was abundance of trees and plant life that converted this toxic carbon dioxide gas into abundance of atmospheric oxygen that allowed this formation of our very first Earth's atmospheric ozone layer. And as you are about to discover in the next chapter, this is why this ozone layer is such an extremely important part of the survival of all life here on Earth today. However, I digress because around 600 million years ago, this is when the very first land-based organisms and simple creatures adapted to new environments to rely on oxygen for breathing and not long after, small genetic variations began the first feeler of animals, in other words, groups of immature oxygen-breathing animals that began appearing in the fossil records and this occurred around the Cambrian explosion approximately 541 million years ago. At this period, many new classifications of different species were found because biologists believe that a steep rise in the oxygen levels sparked huge amounts of species to genetically adapt to these new environments causing many new classifications of new species to appear on land. I would agree with biologists because this steep rise in oxygen represents the most important evolutionary event in the history of life here on Earth. Because around 535 million years ago there was a major diversification of living creatures in the oceans such as chordates, arthropods, for example trilobites, crustaceans, echinoderms, mollusks, brachiopods, foraminifers and radiolariums and only five million years later saw the first known footprints on land indicating that the first feeler of animals, in, o in other words groups of immature animals that began appearing in the fossil records began to walk out of the oceans to adapt to new environments in order to survive to become the first land-based immature animals and this is when we began to find many of these immature animals genetically adapting to their new environments over millions of years that suddenly appeared in the fossil records more complex animals with mineralized skeletal remains that gave way to a world ruled by highly mobile land animals that genetically adapted to evolve with more modern anatomical features. After this date, huge classifications and species of life began to appear on land between 500 million and 250 million years ago. Because of these many different oxygen breathing species having to adapt to new environments in order to survive, this is the period when we also saw some of our very first very important plants 
the lichens appearing on earth around the time of 395 million years ago. This date is very important in our Earth's history because we know that the air, oxygen at this time must have been extremely pure because lichen will only grow in the purest of air. This is why we are going to discuss more about lichen and how important these plants are in the final chapters of this book. But be because there were thousands of different classifications of new species of life that began to appear here on Earth between 500 and 250 million years ago, we are not going to take a great deal of time discussing each of these different classifications. Therefore, for ease and simplification, we are going to jump to the Triassic period around 250 million years ago, where there seemed to be a huge extinction event and 90 to 95% of marine species were wiped out. But many terrestrial organisms began to appear on land, although it took over 30 million years to completely recover because of this huge extinction. However, around 225 million years ago, many new species, having to adapt to new environments in order to survive, gave way to the earliest dinosaurs and the first mammals, Adelobacillus. And five million years later, around 220 million years ago, we began to find the first seed-producing gymnosperm forests that dominated the land and that allowed herbivores, in other words animals that eat plants, to grow to huge sizes to accommodate their large guts necessary to digest the nutrient-rich gymnosperm trees in the forests. This is a perfect example of how nature's adaptation has continued throughout millions of years and is nature's way of having to adapt to its new environment in order to survive because this is also the time when the first ciliophysoid dinosaurs that were the first carnivorous forms, animals that eat meat, began to adapt to new environments in order to survive. We can only assume that these carnivorous dinosaurs genetically adapted because overpopulation of herbivore dinosaurs meant that there must have been a scarcity of vegetation that would need to accommodate their huge guts at this time. But for ease and simplification, we are now going to jump to 130 million years ago when a very important part of our own very early immature human life began to evolve and it only began to happen over a period of millions of years and only once a very important evolutionary event began to give rise to angiosperms. These are flowering plants that produce edible foods and also the rise of our wonderful friends, the bees. Because bees began to adapt to new environments to use pollen as their main food source called nectar and in doing so began to pollinate many different edible angiosperm flowering plants that then germinated and began to produce many different edible fruits, berries, nuts and seeds etc. It's a little more complicated than this but this is how our humble friends the bumblebees began an extremely important advancement in our Earth's evolutionary progression. Because many different classifications of different species of animals, mammals, birds, reptiles and many other different species
began to genetically adapt that relied on these different fruits, berries, nuts and seeds as their main food source for their survival. But through these genetic variations, one of these animals that adapted to this new environment in order to survive became the very first classification of our very own, very ancient and primitive ancestors that we are going to discuss in more detail shortly. And this is why bees have become the exact same process that we still use today to pollinate and germinate all of our different edible foods that arise from flowering plants. And this is why bees are an extremely important part of our survival today and still provides us with 70% of our different flowering edible foods today such as all of our different vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, fruits and many other edible foods. And this is why in this next and final chapter for section 1 we are going to spend some time discussing our vulnerable bee populations because many of our bee populations all over the world today are in crisis and dying from many of our modern intensive farming practices. But let's return now to these many different classifications that began to appear over the next 40 million years or so that began to genetically adapt to eating these new sources of different edible fruits, nuts, berries and seeds etc. However, all of these new and different classifications of new species cannot possibly be given in detail in this condensed history of our earth because there are far too many. Nonetheless, all of these new classifications simply began to adapt to these new environments by eating these new food sources as a means of their survival because at this time, these new angiosperm foods became abundant and plentiful. And so we will now jump to around 66 million years ago, when there was a huge Cretaceous Paleogene extinction that occurred, that eradicated about half of all animal species, including ammonites, plankton and all of the dinosaurs, excluding the birds, thought to be carried out by a massive comet or asteroid impact that many scientists explain gave rise to a high levels of metal iridium. And at this stage in our Earth's evolution, the great universal law of nature and nature's natural biodiversity raised its incredibly intelligent head again to cope with these high levels of metal iridium because this is when a rapid dominance of conifer, conifer forests started to appear such as ginkgo biloba forests that are highly unusual non-flowering plants and trees that were able to adapt to these new environments to cope with these new high levels of metal iridium and that grew in high latitudes along with the appearance of new species of mammals that became the dominant species able to adapt to these new environments in order to survive through eating these particular ginkgo conifer plants and trees. This is yet another example of how all species adapts to new environments in order to survive or cannot adapt and goes extinct. And then, around 63 million years ago, there was a massive evolution of creodonts, an important group of meat-eating carnivorous mammals. And three million years later, the first flightless birds appeared, and also the earliest true primates and other classifications of carnivorous mammals, myocids. Again, for ease and simplification, we are going to skip 
a few million years, as again genetic variations began thousands of different new classifications of plants and animals that began to adapt to new environments through the abundance of different new foods available. And because there are far too many different new classifications to mention here, literally thousands, we will instead jump to an important age on Earth of around 16 to 14 million years ago in the middle of the Miocene epoch when a global cooling trend continued and polar ice caps reduced the amount of water in the oceans causing sea levels to drop and exposed previously submerged coastal lands and as a result of this continental drift a land connection appeared between Africa and Eurasia along the eastern Mediterranean coasts that provided ease of migration for primates and other animals. As a re result of these climate changes, tropical forests began to be replaced by sparse woodlands and new selective environmental pressures evolved new primate changes that had to adapt to new environments. Primate fossils are quite common from the Miocene epoch and apes apparently evolved from monkeys early in the epoch. This is why one of the earliest monkey to ape transitional primates was called Proconsul that lived in the African forests around 21 to 14 million years ago. There is contention, in other words, our ego emotions, over our first human origins. However, Proconsul holds a special place in hominid paleontology when its remains were first discovered back in 1909, when Proconsul was not only the oldest ape yet identified, but the first prehistoric, prehistoric mammal ever to be unearthed in sub Saharan Africa. Many people mistakenly believe that Proconsul was one of the immediate predecessors of Homo sapiens. In fact, although this ancient primate lived during the Miocene epoch from about 23 to 17 million years ago, this was at least 15 million years before the first recognisable human ancestors such as Australopithecus and Paranthropus, evolved in Africa. This is why it's not even sure that Proconsul spawned the line of hominids that led to modern humans, because this primate may have belonged to a sister taxon. In other words, it may be the closest relatives of another in our evolutionary tree which would make it more of a great-great-great-uncle a thousand times removed. However, now that we have discussed that all species of life has to genetically adapt to new environments in order to survive and that this adaptation mostly happens throughout a period of many thousands of generations and this gen genetic adaptation is passed on and genetically inherited through all offspring born. This is how scientists have now identified that chimpanzees and humans are estimated to have shared common ancestors. You can read more about this dramatic chimp to human story through an independent international team of researchers found in the index that sequenced the genome of the bonobo for the first time, confirming that we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees, making them our closest living relatives. But there are two species of apes that are closely related to humans, bonobos, pan paniscus, and the common chimpanzee, pan troglodytes. This has prompted researchers to speculate whether the ancestor of humans 
chimpanzees and bonobos looked and acted more like bonobo, a chimpanzee or something else? And how all three species have evolved differently since the ancestor of humans split with the common ancestor of bonobos and chimps between four and seven million years ago in Africa. This means that only 1% of our human DNA has made such a significant difference to the evolution of modern mankind today. What is this 1% and how has this 1% evolved us into the modern humans that we all are today? Because we may think that 1% is a very small difference. However, compared to the genome of a species, it makes a huge difference, as we have already discussed throughout many previous chapters. And if we identify that there are only a few gene sequence difference between humans and chimpanzees, this explains how extremely slow genetic variations takes to occur, not through a couple of generations, but sometimes through thousands and thousands of generations, through having to adapt to many different environmental factors in order to survive, because these environmental pressures began to force the genetic adaptation and evolution of the very first ancient humans, because we can clearly see that primates are relative newcomers to our planet Earth compared to most other classifications of other species of life here on Earth. We know this because the earliest ever fossil records of primates dates back to only 50 to 55 million years ago. However, the earliest species of prim primitive humans coming directly from primates can only be dated as recent as 7 million years ago. In other words, we are a very young species compared to the rest of many other classifications of species of life here on Earth. However, we mustn't forget why these genetic variations occurred in the first place. Because our very ancient ancestors needed to adapt to new environments in order to survive. And so instead of swinging in the lush forests living on leaves and berries 16 to 14 million years ago in the middle of the Miocene epoch when a global cooling trend continued and polar ice caps reduced the amount of water in the oceans, this caused sea levels to drop and this then exposed previously submerged coastal lands. And as a result of this continental drift, a land connection appeared between Africa and Eurasia along the eastern Mediterranean coasts that provided ease of migration for primates and other animals, as we mentioned earlier. And as a result of these climate changes, tropical forests began to be replaced by sparse woodlands, and new selective environmental pressures evolved new primate changes that had to adapt to new environments in order to survive. This is how our ancient ancestors had to find new sources of food in order to survive. And so throughout thousands of generations of offspring born, our ancient, our ancient ancestors were forced to adapt themselves for instance, by beginning to walk upright on two legs in order to look for other food sources that were accessible for them to survive on ground level, such as nuts, seeds and berries and fruits, etc. But remember that this all happened over many thousands and thousands of generations. And so our ancient ancestors began to adapt to these new environments in order to continue to survive, because the, if they couldn't adapt, they would have simply gone extinct. Now that we have concluded 
that all species of life has a direct evolutionary connection from the very first very simple plant life that first began here on earth approximately 3,000 million years ago. This evolutionary progression clearly identifies that our human genes also originated from a very very long sequence throughout millions of years of our Earth's evolutionary development that first began through the great universal law of nature that first created this complex process photosynthesis. This is why we are all earthlings, all created through the great universal law of nature, every single one of us. And this is why adapting to new environments is a very important aspect of human survival and is especially relevant in our modern world today now that there are nearly 8 billion people living on our fragile planet Earth because we now have some brand new environmental pressures that are now threatening our survival and that we are now going to discuss in this next and final chapter for section 1.